lunch. Uh, I want to introduce you to Dr. Tony Neary. Dr. Neary is a medical doctor. He's also a, a wildlife and firefighter, as well as um, he assists with, with the Shrive Burns here in Georgia. And uh, Andrew, if you would school up Dr. Neary's presentation, all right, you should be good to go. Dr. Neary. Good afternoon. <clears throat> all right, so a couple of things. First of all, I'm, I'm Tony Neri. I'm a physician with CDC. And my, our disclaimer from CDC is the talk doesn't represent CDC in entirety. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, first of all, I want to thank Colonel Malling for hosting us today. This is a beautiful venue. I had an opportunity to present at Tifton and I really enjoyed it. And this is a really neat opportunity here too. Thanks much to Scott and his wife for putting everything together. This is a really big lift and I, I very much appreciate all their work in doing it. And, and I also, I just see a lot of friends here in the room. I've been burning with DNR for the last 12 plus years. And uh, I, I was raised by wolves in Colorado and I was a firefighter out there. So I have about 20 years in the fire service overall, mostly in wildland fire, but a little bit in structural. Um, uh, second thing is the uniform. So what's the uniform all about? I'm with the public health service, which is based on quarantine in the United States. I work for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which you heard probably a lot more about than you had ever planned to in the last three years. But we focus on quarantine. It's the same rank structure as the Navy. So I'm a captain, which means in the morning, I got a lot of talk about being a colonel out at the hotel, so I'm a captain. Um, <clears throat> why is CDC here? So CDC, uh, typically you thought about Ebola or COVID and all these other infectious diseases, but really we got involved in, in uh, wildland fire more so in the last couple of years related to smoke. So the smoke coming out of the Canadian wildfires was a, a big eye opener for the East Coast. And so CDC has been slowly picking away at work uh, related to smoke. So smoke, as you know, had, knows no geographic boundaries as readily demonstrated, but, but the smoke that they're planning to do, the Forest Service and a lot of land management agencies are moving with an eye with, with what you all are doing towards a prevention focus, so a prescribed fire focus rather than a reactive wildfire focus. And there's going to be a balance in the nation as we shift over that way. But we work directly with, from the CDC angle with the Environmental Protection Agency, USDA, Department of Interior, and a bunch of land management agencies about how do you address smoke and the ambient air quality standards uh, that are impacted by the smoke that you might be putting up in Albany or wherever. In addition to smoke, at CDC, we get our job is to support the state and local health department. So we get involved in wildfires and even prescribed fire from the aspect of prevention, response, and recovery in uh, places like Hawaii most recently, but also Gatlinburg or Boulder, Colorado. Those are places where we're actively engaged in trying to understand how do we help those communities prepare for smoke and wildfire and how do we help them recover when they need to. Um, one of the indications of that, and just to show you, we have some skin in the game, is that CDC became a signatory member on Wild and Fire Leadership Council this year, which is a, a national group that puts together um, a, a, a document which escapes my mind what the name of it was, but uh, the national, someone remember the name of the document with like puts forward? I'm usually at the ground level of fire, and now I'm up at here somewhere. Uh, the community, and then also we are also involved in a number of interagency work groups, as well as the, the Wildfire Commission, which is an advisory group from the federal agencies to Congress about how do you better work with wild and fire, and particularly with my role at CDC and my background being able and fortunate to work with you all. I have the opportunity to talk a lot more about prescribed fire rather than a reactive wildfire. And I think the nation is headed towards a more prescribed fire focus. And they look to you all, like I said. Um, one of the other things I, I wanted to highlight is this, uh, with the resources you saw up here, was the Community Wildfire Defense Grants. There is an intent from our angle, from the CDC angle, to help communities get access to that billion dollars of funding or so and with a prescribed fire focus. And so I, I defer to uh, a lot of the folks that were up here earlier about how to access them, but but know that we have we have the interests of the communities most at heart and, and we're here to help support you. All right, with that, 
said, let's talk a little bit about heat trauma and drama. Sounds like a soap opera. Right? Mm. All right, um, this is one of my fa favorite sayings by Churchill. And it really comes down to my role as a physician on fires. I said I've been around fire since 98 or so. And uh, it's often, it comes back to me as the physician to understand and deal with issues as they come. But one of the things we most often run into in the, when I'm out with the interagency burn teams is, is this idea about failing to plan or plan to fail. What does that mean? Uh, coming out of this talk, I wanted you to ask yourself five questions and, and you have, um, when you have the time or two o'clock in the morning when you can't sleep or whatever. So what am I gonna do if there's a medical incident? And how many of you have seen or had been around a medical incident on one of your burns? Raise your hand. So a couple of you. And it's not just having been on major wildland fires. These happen on state or private landowner fires too. And I think the harder things on medical incidents on private landowner fires is it could be someone you really know quite well. And that can make it a lot more difficult to think about how do I address this and not freak out. How far away is the nearest hospital that can handle trauma? So this isn't the Doc McStuffins or Doc Holiday down the street, or even maybe the local hospital, because they might not be able to handle the trauma that you can come that can come out of a fire. Um, and then in addition, if you have a medical incident or you really plan for a medical incident to come down, then you at least understand where you're gonna go and whether they need to have a helicopter, a medical helicopter come from a more staffed hospital come to meet you. Because as you can see, your times to wait between the time an incident happens, whether that's heat-related illness or a trauma, those increase exponentially. And um, they're often far, far longer than you would want. So knowing which hospital can really handle trauma and how to get people to it is gonna be important for you to think about. How long does it take to get trained medical personnel here? Georgia has um, is, is certainly such a rural state that you might not have a volunteer fire department in, in your region for a while, in your area for a while. And not only that, we'll have some example about this, but is it are you getting the right folks in at the right time? So if you're far, far back in the back of your property that can't get access from a UTV or ATV or even a fire truck, then you need to think about how we're going to get people in and how we're going to get people out. How long is it going to take to set someone up? So think about those things, and I hope you at least planted the seed for the next couple of days of your thoughts as you go on and prescribe fires, and I'll give you some resources to help deal with them. This is a, a part of the refresher that we did with the department, with DNR and the interagency bird team last year. I wanted to review it. This is a, so Lynn Rosenberg is a firefighter out of Ohio, a young lady who, who died on this fire. It was a prescribed fire up in Pigeon Creek which isn't too far from a, a somewhat urban area in Ohio. This is a burn unit. It's a UTV trail. You can see the blue circle has, has the burn unit overall, and the trail itself is the brown. So the, they're burning within this trail. And what happened is towards the end of the day, it always happens at the end of the day because we're tired, we're hungry, we're trying to get home. You can see on the bottom left, there's a parked UTV. And what happened on the top right, there's a red one. Uh, this is victim's UTV. It basically someone's foot got stuck under the accelerator and it rolled up to the opposite side and flipped over and crushed this lady. And then, so what does that mean? So the crash was right up here. You can see the P is the parking spot. And the key thing here in this whole scenario is that they, when they briefed the fire, when they're starting out to do their fire, someone said, hey, we probably need a helicopter landing spot. Where do we got one of those? And then that, that ended up being the parking spot. And, and I think that that's really important to consider because no one was able to park their cars intentionally. They, they parked their cars away from that. If you have a medical problem that goes down, no one's going to be digging around in their pockets for their keys to move their cars out of the way. That, that takes up a huge amount of time and you might not have the keys in the right place. But they really thought that through. And it wasn't anything more than a one minute conversation with the burn boss about where are we going to land a helicopter if we need to. The more you can bake that into the how you think about wildland fire and how you think about prescribed burns is really, really important. And you'll see how long that takes. This is about a mile to get in to an outside of the evacuation site. And this is where the helicopter landed. So this is um, 
an example, but it also is indicative of a place where you have pretty good access for, via UTV. If you hit a crash back on the, the left side of the graph where the burn unit is, the burn unit arrow is, that would have been a very different scenario. Let's see how long it took to get there. So in about 15 minutes from the time they called 911 to get this lady, they're able to get the, the UTV off of her and they called 911. So EMS was on site within 15 minutes. It took about 20 minutes to transport to a helicopter. And then it took about another 10 minutes to get to the liftoff. It's about a 45 minute window. And I'm gonna tell you that's a super generous, that's a really, really fast response for being in a, in a somewhat rural area of Ohio. If there's anything you get out of this presentation, it's going to take a long time for you to get folks out. And it's not just um, uh, like if she couldn't clearly walk out, but if she were on a hand line, you're talking about hours of response time. And it's also going to take a lot more personnel than you would think. So I urge you to pull the trigger on requesting a lot more resources at the start, because not only do you have a medical incident, but you have an active fire in the background. And beyond that, you have a helicopter, if you do a helicopter, that might or might not be able to land because you have smoke in the area and it's very dusty. Um, but think some of these things through as you're as you're going through your planning. And I, I, that's the my main request of the day. Fortunately, there's a lot of resources in which you can think this through a, a little bit about medical evaluation. Realistic times is, is the most critical one. Has anyone who here has seen the incident response pocket guide? Who keeps that in their fire gear? Yeah, a good number of people. There's always a section in the IRPG. doesn't matter what year it is. There's always a section that's usually red. It's called the nine line item. Nine line item of the IRPG is incident response pocket guide. Take a, uh, um, we'll go through it in a second, but then think about all these other things that, that lead up to a crash or a, a fatality. And there's there's a cumulative amount of problems that occurred in that scenario. It wasn't just that someone's foot got stuck under an accelerator for, for her. It was that it was towards the end of the day, everyone's tired. We're trying to rush to get out. We aren't hydrated. Think about all those things and making sure they had enough food. Thinking about all those things in advance has a huge prevention factor in trying to get you from being in those scenarios in the first place. This is a brief walk through the M medical incident report, also called the nine line, because you can see on the bottom, it doesn't go into, it only goes to seven on the side, on the right side, but it goes all the way down to nine. But when we train our folks on the interagency burn teams, we'll walk them through it this year as a as a preview to what we're going to train on this year for the MIR for all the people going to our DNR refreshers. But I, I force people who don't have much medical experience to number one, assess a person in our trainings, our annual refreshers, because we don't have much, I don't have a great deal of medical capacity within the IVT. And I want people to, to experience real world scenarios. And you can use the medical incident report to help assess them. So you can see um, in the, on the right side, there's the IRPG page 106, which helps you walk through step by step. And 911 operators will help you do this too. But I want purposely to make people feel uncomfortable in our trainings and use this because what I'll have them do after I create a scenario in our training is I'll have them walk through this nine line and call 911, not for real, but they'll call our facilitator. And then 911 is going to ask them all these different things that are on this nine line item. And uh, again, to just think these things through what you're going to do. Where's our nearest hospital? If I get a snake bite, I need to let the hospital know because sometimes we have to medevac a person from that hospital to another hospital, or we have to medevac um, medicine from another hospital back to the one we're transporting someone to. If we have a helicopter on the fire, generally that's probably not going to be an efficient way to transport someone out, even though we always think about it, because they're not going to let a helicopter full of fire fireballs land on the top of a on the hospital that wouldn't work out too well and you got to unload all the stuff and by the time you unload all the stuff out of a fire helicopter you might as well get a medevac helicopter in there and you aren't going to be able to land a helicopter in there if you don't have the appropriate personnel to assess the area so there's a lot of things that stack up and i think in life in general in medicine Medicine is something that stacks up on you. It's not that you one day develop a heart attack. It's that you have all these different things that you lead up to having a heart attack. 
Same thing with medical incident report. It gains momentum when you get into it. Sorry, with medical incident. It gains momentum, and those things stack up on a person that lead to them surviving or doing well in a medical incident or not. And being able to plan in advance would be really helpful. So uh, that's my first part on a lot of things we do is really about more medical stuff than uh, trauma per se, but I want you to think both of those things through. So um, this is a really cool picture where I think Phil and I were out at Red Top Mountain. This is Kat. And her, her, uh, all right, so this is heat-related illness amongst high school athletes by month. So you can see the peak is in August. Why is the peak? These are all healthy young kids, right? I might play Pokemon or be on Nintendo too much, but why do you think that there's a peak in August? So they're doing football, but these are healthy young people. Why are they getting heat-related illness in August? practice for the day so, so they're working out really intensely they're doing double or triple practice and they've all sat on their butts the whole time in june and july and they just played video games in the heat so now in august in the peak of heat season they're getting hurt from heat related illness and this is the key to uh heat related illness overall and because we're inherently in hot environments doesn't matter whether it's winter or summer it's wild and fire the more there's strong evidence to show the more you train in the heat and you do the things that you do uh, are going to do on the fire, the less likely you are to get heat related illness or injured on that. So that's why we have the pack test, right? You, you pack a 45 pound pack under 45 minutes for three miles because that's what we do on fires and that's helped you prepare for it. So if, as you get yourself or your crew or your family ready for burn season, whenever that is for you, Think about, are we doing things that are making us uncomfortable or exposing us to, say, situations where we are simulating what we're doing in a fire? So, um, and that happens whether it's among high school students or adults. So this is all, all the risk factors related to heat-related illness that you could come back to. These are all the things that are, that are quite normal in the wild and fire world. Everyone at wild and fire season tends to hit people. Says, oh, I should have trained more. I should have prepared more. But we, we inherently work in hot and humid environments. It can be easy to not train before you go into the fire grounds, before you do a prescribed fire. But it's really the, it's not the day before you go into a fire. It's not the month before. It's the three to four months before that. And it's the year before that. Are you walking? Are you doing something active outside? Are you trying to simulate the weight and the endurance that you need for that fire? Putting on a lot of excess clothing equipment, it's always a balance in wild and fire because you want to make sure that you're protected from the fire itself, but then also not overheating because you're inherently to overheat. And even in the cold weather, what can happen is you'll get people out on prescribed fires in early in January or February in Georgia, and then they'll sweat a lot, and then they'll get really cold towards the end of the fire because they're getting hypothermic because they're sweating so much in the first part, and, and vice versa. You can get really cold until the start, and then someone lights the fire, and you get warm, and you get cold later on. So thinking about the balance of excess clothing and equipment and making sure you have the right equipment available. Do people have fire shelters? Do they bring in their lunch with them? Are they bringing water? Is there water on your truck? Is there water freely available? I was out on a burn with the Forest Service a couple months ago, and and I'm, I got to admit, I'm somewhat addicted to water. As and so they, I said, hey, do you guys have some more water on your race? Said, no, you just got what you carry. It's, oh, man, because I know DNR will go out of our way to carry coolers of, with water and ideal with ice water, but it doesn't have to be ice water, but just to fill up your water bottle. That availability or putting that camelback or that bladder into your, into your backpack and having water available right next to you instead of having to reach around for it is proven across the entire fire world, and especially in the West. Once you have that access, you're going to drink from it more. Just like you put a bag of potato chips in front of you in TV, you're going to eat more potato chips, right? So if you put water right next to your face during um, fire work, you're going to drink more water. Um, we often talk about what heat-related illness is, and if you get super dorked out about it with medical terms, you can talk about heat stroke versus exhaustion, where your skin is dry or not dry, and we have nausea or vomit. But really, this is a spectrum. So what I think you should most focus on is the left side of the equation. So, And it's really knowing the people you're out with. So asking a person to do the same test as you would do for a DUI works pretty well for heat-related illness coming backwards. And if you've never done a DUI test, which is probably a good thing, 
you you want to come back and think about is my friend thinking clearly can he subtract from a 100 by sevens and still come out with the right number a couple times can he talk use all his fingers all these other things to say that my buddy isn't acting normal because i guarantee you if your buddy's not acting normal because they're getting exposed to eat there's a bunch of other people on that fire that are also not having trouble with heat so just thinking that through, I don't care as a doc whether you're going to diagnose with heat cramps or heat exhaustion or heat stroke, but I care that you recognize whether a person's thinking clearly or not thinking clearly. And I also want you to recognize that there's momentum in this. Once you start going heat cramps and heat exhaustion or heat stroke, there's a rapidity in which that increases and people can go down quite, quite quickly if you're not aware of what's going on. So uh, when you treat heat-related illness, number one, you stop working you hydrate them with cold electrolyte drinks or water. And the agency made me change that. But I want to say, I usually use like V8 because it has a lot of salt in it or Gatorade. Things like that to get your salt level back up. That's what those folks are doing because they're peeing out most of the salt in their sweat or sweating it out or peeing it out. We're going to put them in the shade or AC truck. And uh, I grew up uh, west, like I said, and usually you could throw them in a creek in the west and you, they get cooler. But if you throw them in a creek in Georgia, they're just wet and hot. <laughs> So you don't throw them in a creek and that probably doesn't work in Georgia, but you can put them in on in air conditioning in your truck. Um, I started playing around with the idea of cooling vests and you saw it if you got a, like a tour to France or even the, uh, a couple of golf tournaments of cooling vests. I think that takes a lot of work to get involved with. I wouldn't advocate that on an agency wide basis, but I've liked the cooling vest over time. And even uh, myself as I do a lot of endurance sports and I'll have um, a, a sock and I'll put ice in it and I'll put it around my neck and that helps cool all the blood going to my head. So at least my head doesn't think it's too hot. The rest of my body is telling it is. But things like that to help cool you down or cool your crew down are really important. Check the rest of your crew. If one person goes down, I can guarantee other people are gonna, gonna come, come out poorly with it and it creates this domino effect. So not only is that one person down, but you get other people who can't evacuate the person who's already down because they're getting heat related illness too. So the more you can keep your eye on this as a fire manager, the more important it is. Um, and these are just a couple of things related to the prevention. So hot, hard, high, hot environments, start early, start early in the morning, take frequent breaks during the afternoon, taper off your fire as you get towards the afternoon. Don't expect to do logarithmic, excuse me, logarithmic more work in the afternoon just because you started late early on. Um, Think about exercising, get up, walk the dog, walk the cat, whatever you want to do, say hi to your goldfish. The exercise in the heat and go fishing, whatever you want to do, but get some training outside, make sure your crew does too. Um, small fitness goals. I, I never have been a big fan of all of the, the shocking fitness things where they'll boot camp you into shape because what happens is you boot camp and then you crash. It's not it's like having a lot of, of a frosty, frosted Cheerios. You go up and you come down. You go up, you go. Um, having something that you like to do on a regular basis is really important. Making sure you have the right gear at the right time and the right nutrition around is also really important to you. Bringing extra food for people that uh, that could have it. You can bring a, a dry thing of Gatorade you get from Publix or Kroger and, and uh, uh, the powder and then mix it into their water. I carry packets of Gatorade in my, in my medical stuff too. So just stuff like that and just thinking about those things is really important. That's about it. Oh, yeah. Um, this is just a reminder that this is something that went down. It can readily happen to you and it will take a lot, lot longer normally to get out than 45 minutes. I would say hours. And it's going to take at least six people on, on a litter to walk somebody out and you have an active burn. So think about those things as you go through your medical planning. Think about where you're going to go, what are you going to do, and how are you going to get folks in or out as, uh, as you go along. Uh, this is my contact information and, and phone number. You can call me or email me. I don't know anything about Twitter, or Facebook, stuff like that, but you can do one of these old school methods and I'll get a hold. Thank you. That's all I have. Okay. Well, thanks. This is important stuff. So, great the time for questions. If anybody has them, you don't get to talk to a medical doctor for free very often. <laughs> I'll send you the bill. Here we go. Eric, Eric's coming by.
And I assume back in the dark ages of the 60s, they did not allow us to drink water. What about that? I don't remember anybody ever falling out or having to be touched. Any of that. That was two day practices in August. Can you acclimate to dehydration? Mm -hmm. Hmm. There is, uh, so there are studies that show if you move to really dry environments between dry and humid environments that your body can change the way it sweats. And so I'd say that there, there is some ability for your body to acclimate towards heat. I wouldn't restrict water as a way to do that. I would increase your workload and I would increase it earlier in June or July. So I would taper up to that hard work rather than restricting water. Um, you can always gauge how much how much hydration you have, and everyone here probably knows this, but it's the color of your urine, right? As it gets darker, then you have less and less water in your body. The problem when you start restricting water is that it can be, it's just a slippery slope. It's just sort of difficult to, to deal with. Um, if you do have someone that has a problem with it, how do you, how do you deal with that? I I'd, I'd say I'd rather not restrict water and then encourage more exercise on the other side of it <clears throat> rather than vice versa. I'd always have access to water, but not, and I'd increase my exercise. And it's balance, right? You got to find people that are willing to work and willing to work hard. So um, that can be tough nowadays, but building up and is going to be more helpful in that regard. Good question. Other questions? Yeah, I Hey, while I'm walking, by the way, when I played high school football, it seems that you had one little tiny cup of Gatorade halfway through, and by the time it came, it was the ice and long belt in there, and juicy mass. <laughs> <laughs> it's like protein, right? <laughs> going, going along with what the first gentleman said, yes. uh, we weren't allowed to have water, but we also were mandated to take a cup of salt to have this. Right. So, can you elaborate on how that might or might not help us? In a bit? Yeah, and so in I do a lot of endurance type athlete stuff. I'm not a good one, but I do it. And what uh, so there's two two aspects of that. Number one is the salt you intake. So there's a theory that the more salt you intake on your day to day basis, the more you sweat because there's a lot of sodium in your body that gets out, and the more your kidneys are trying to get things out of it, um, separate out the salt from the water that's coming into your body. So uh, some endurance athletes that do better with water management will have lower sodium content as they build up to their race, as they do more outdoor extreme sports. So, and, and in general, I think the U.S. has a very high sodium concentration in its food. So if you decrease the amount of salt you have in your food, that probably benefits you from not sweating as much out. When you get into endurance, when you get into firefighting or working out or doing football practice, that's where you can use salt, right? And you can you can use salt to balance it back out. I, I think that there's really good evidence to show a lot of those electrolyte drinks, whether it's Gatorade or something don't have sugar in them, um, are very powerful. And it's about the amount of sodium that's in them. Salt tablets are sometimes palatable to people, sometimes they're not, and they can make people really, really sick. Um, but it's the same concept of replacing electrolytes you have. And not only to say during the exercise, but after the exercise. That doesn't mean you got to be drinking Gatorade sport with high concentrations of sugar and salt all the time. But I usually have a Gatorade or two afterwards in the car. So I recover my electrolytes more rapidly. And not only that, but you're also needing to hydrate after you do what would be considered for most people pretty extreme exercise, which also decreases your chances of rhabdomyolysis and what's basically breaking down your muscles and clogging up your kidneys with all of this muscles you're tearing from this extreme endeavor. So having enough water helps flush that through your kidneys and then having salt or some sodium type concentration thing um, during the exercise is helpful. So I'd say that that's, that's a good approach. Uh, salt tablets are not something my stomach tolerates well, but it might be. So I have all of that. The bottom line would be if you're managing fire crew, Hot day, giving them salt tablets ahead of time might be fine. Well, what I'll do, I, I think you got to, I wouldn't do salt tablets if I had something available. I do V8, if I was to be honest with you. Have something available like Gatorade, V8. That, that you can drink. Salt tablets, I think you're going to make people, they might not be able to take them in because they're just too much salt at one time. 
but just having that available during the time period and making it acceptable to drink those things is is probably the most critical factor. And you get one. Sometimes I have people that that want that don't want any sugar in them because they have diabetes or other things. I, I think there's two considerations there. One is if you're uh, such a fragile diabetic that you're on a fire, you need to think about where you need to be in that fire, and maybe on the engine or maybe at the truck in a cooler spot. But two, there are electrolyte drinks um, that. Uh, triathletes use nun is one of them that have no sugar in them and just concentrations of salt uh, that are they're acceptable if, if 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 that degree of sugar is uh, going to throw off your diabetes but then again just think whether you need to be out in the field too much if you're that fragile diabetic average your advice on the web is like by ah yeah um uh, so there's a couple things with with snakes number one is you want to make sure uh, where is it? JT, I don't think JT is here, but uh, we had a guy at DNR who got bitten by a snake. He's a huge football player last year, football type player, and it's stuck in his thumb, the fan stuck in his thumb, the copperhead and pulled it out. But there's a couple things with it, which I thought was such an impressive story. With snake bites, what you need to do is, I, I call it a restricting band. You can basically put a rubber band or two around your arm and you can, I want you to be able to slip two fingers under it. I mean, it does, it's almost like what you would do for a, a little bit loose of an IV when someone starts an IV to restrict that. And you don't move it. And then you can call the hospital in advance because you want to make sure they have the right antivenom around. And if they're flying it, they might have to fly the antivenom to you. So you basically put a restricting band on it. Some people don't like the restricting band because it can cause too much constriction, not let enough blood flow through it. But I think that there's, or it's been shown there's good evidence. As long as you don't crank down on it like the belt, you're not trying to tourniquet off your arm. You're just trying to restrict as much blood flow as, as um, would be reasonable to still get blood flow in that arm. Call the call the hospital, tell them you're coming in with a snake bite so they can prepare whether they life flight antivenom to that place or making sure they're ready to treat you and um, immobilize it. So if you get bit in the leg, you're not gonna walk out probably because you don't wanna move all that venom through. And when you do get it, who here has been bitten by a venomous snake? I know. We'll hope you never get bit by a venomous snake. But what they do is they'll mark the, the, the swelling that goes up in your arm with a Sharpie marker. And if it gets too far up in your arm or leg, they'll start, they'll start um, doing things to release that pressure so, right after the yeah. graphic and my medical descriptions. But, uh, but that's what they'll do. But it's all trying to get that that uh, the venom out and there used to be a difference between copperhead snakes that we would see in georgia and the venom antivenom we had at the time but that the current antivenom works against copperhead snake venom as well so that shouldn't be a factor yeah just do you have any you know off the off uh, tricks for treating a fire burn on scene but i mean i know you have all the medical equipment but if you don't have a lot of stuff there any um, so the question is, uh, do you have, uh, what would see, what do you got if you got a medical, if you got a burn on the fire? And, and so I think the, the most important thing is take the heat away so you can pour water on it and then um, uh, to, to dry it off as much as you can and, and, and uh, cool it down first to dry it and then wrap it. And you can tell the, the degree of burn is how far it goes, whether you have charring down to the bone or to the skin, all these things. Skin's like a sunburn. All the way down to the bone is a third degree burn. Um, and, and I would say just to cool it and dry it, it's not necessarily about mobilizing it. The thing you problem, the problem you have with burns is really about infection afterwards. And so making sure that you have sterile, like drinkable water, which has a sufficient amount of chlorine in it to pour on it, not put it in the creek, because that's probably not as great for it. They'll wash the heck out of it in the ER and in, in the in the burn unit. But trying to keep as much sterile water as you could on it, keep it as dry and clean as possible. You don't want to wrap it in the Nomex from your buddy that just been all over diesel and gas. And all this. But yeah. And the other thing about if you have severe burns is to let the 911 operator know, or even if you're close to a hospital, you consider calling 911 because there are specialized burn units in Georgia that they'll medevac you to, but that takes a lot of logistics of getting a helicopter to your local hospital. So so Doc Holiday can get you to the right place you need to go. Okay, uh, this will be our last. 
one thing most of them probably encounter if you get tore up by yellow jackets. Oh, yeah. How many bee seeds and how long does it take before you should get in three bucks? I said, in Montana, the guy got stung one time. Yeah. I mean, he locked up. We just about had to do the trick, get on there. Yeah. And I've seen others take 20 hits and be fine. What should you look for if someone gets wrapped up? All right. Um, so everyone has their own sensitivities to allergies nowadays, whether it's peanuts or social media or yellow jackets. And and what I look for is is the swelling at the site. So I'll look for original sting and see what people are, what the swelling is on the site. And you can just push your finger on it to see whether it blanches out um, and and um, it, whether it gets white or not. If it, if it stays red, then you can see it to spread. And I'll watch for it to spread. And then as it gets more systemic, I'll look to see whether a person's, how they're doing. And I'll talk to them in that same level of consciousness. Can you count backwards by sevens from a hundred? Are you starting to think straight or are you freaking out? Probably freaking out. But the um, but then the next level is I'll see how they're breathing and talking to me. And that's just a casual conversation. That's not me doing any complex medical exam. It's me talking to, to Braxton and saying, hey, how about the Braves this week or something like that? And, and as they get further along in their anaphylaxis, is a reactive term to yellow jacket stings or other stings, then they have less ability to breathe and talk. And I know I need to start taking more action like Benadryl. I'll, I'll sometimes load people up with Benadryl to start. Um, some people might have EpiPens. You can use those, but they only last for a short period of time. But as their breathing becomes more labored, and it's the number of words you speak in your, when you're talking is indicative of how severe it is. So if you get down to one word sentences, then that's when you know we're starting to think about intubating you. Uh, the other thing is uh, with EpiPens, if you're way out in the field, EpiPens only last for like 10 or 15 minutes. And so you got to get other EpiPens or someone with an IV with epinephrine up to you. And that's where you need to pull the trigger early for a 911. It's not that you your body just is a little bit allergic to stuff. It's that you're going to need epinephrine for the next hour to pull them out. And that's going to take an IV. It's going to take a medic and all these other things. Um, I treat it with Benadryl. I've had people, when I was working up in northern Nigeria, had a person with anaphylactic shock that had down to one word sentences. And I just high dosed them with Benadryl, and that worked out pretty well. That's what we'll give you in the ER by IV, too. So if you can do start some oral Benadryl, then that works out. Just tell them what you give so you don't high dose somebody with tons of pain. Okay, thank you so much. Great questions, y'all. Yeah. I wish we could do more. We do have to move on. But at, the, at, the, at our next and final break, it's going to be up to this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.